Good morning. So lovely to see everyone here. We are very excited to be here to talk about the United States Energy and Employment Report. We have a wonderful roundtable event today. But we're here to talk the United States Energy and Employment Report. Prior to the COVID pandemic, the energy sector was one of the country's fastest growing. As a result of the pandemic, we lost 839,000 jobs. However, despite this, continued investments prevented further decline, and remarkably, there were some bright spots. Wind generation increased by 2,000 jobs, battery energy storage increased by 800 jobs, hybrid electric vehicles increased by 6,000 jobs. This report that we're about to talk about today, the United States Energy and Employment Report, underscores the need for continued investment in the sector. Why? We know investments in the energy infrastructure pay dividends. Workers are more likely to be unionized and collective bargaining agreements help achieve worker equity goals not seen in other sectors to the same degree. And that's before taking into account that wages in the energy sector are significantly higher than the overall median wage. So now let's talk about the event. We have some wonderful people here. We have Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire. We have Chris Bollinger from Hecate Energy. We have Pedro Pizarro from Edison International. We have Madeline Janis from Jobs to Move America. We have Sandy Fazelli from the National Association of State and Energy Official, uh, Officials, or as we affectionately refer to them, NASIO. And to kick us all off is our fearless leader, the wonderful and amazing Secretary of Energy, Secretary Jennifer M. Granholm. And I'm going to throw it over to her virtually. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Really appreciate everybody joining us to roll this out. It's great to be here, not just to celebrate the return of this report to the Department of Energy, but also to recognize its importance. Because this isn't just any old you know, energy jobs report. The, the insights from employers themselves and the level of detail by industry, by state, on demographics, on union membership, you know, it's really, it's really amazing and unparalleled. I encourage everybody to look at it. The U.S. Energy and Employment Report is um, really quite simply the most complete snapshot that you can get of who works in the energy field and where they work. So today we're very proud to be able to say we're bringing this report back to DOE and we're going to fulfill our responsibility to gather and to report on this data every year. And I want to say just how grateful I am to Senator Shaheen, who not only secured the funding for this report, but persisted in figuring out why it wasn't being published over the past couple of years. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank NASIO and the Energy Futures Initiative uh, Secretary Moniz for heroically stepping up when it became clear that the previous administration didn't plan to meet their obligations. So know that it's because of you that we know now just how much the energy sector, especially clean energy, has grown in recent years. So before the pandemic, the energy industry was growing twice as fast as the overall economy. And the fastest growing job in America was a wind turbine technician. And, and while energy was not immune to COVID-19, of course, we now know that the industry uh, is, is really recovering very quickly. It's regaining about six, it did regain about uh, 560,000 jobs before the end of 2020. And what's more, energy, uh, clean energy in particular, showed great resilience. Uh, wind energy and battery storage and electric vehicles all added workers in 2020, despite COVID, because there was just consistent investment in those technologies, even in the face of, of a global pandemic. This uh, report, the report's surveys 
of energy employers show that they're already anticipating a huge surge of growth in this year and beyond. Plus this uh, recent study, a recent study found that wages in the energy industry, as Jennifer was saying, are 34% higher than wages in the overall economy. And that means if we make the right transformative investments in clean energy right now, it would do much more than make up for last year's losses. It would build you know, we'd build a bigger, better, and stronger energy workforce. We'd see millions more Americans building wind turbines and laying transmission lines and making buildings more efficient and running advanced nuclear plants and assembling batteries and electric vehicles and so much more. And we would have a chance to address the big uh, shortcoming that this report points out, which is that while we do have work to do to make our energy sector um, uh, more robust, we also have a lot of work to do in making our energy sector look like America and to make sure that these new clean energy jobs are paying family sustaining wages with good benefits and union membership. So with President's build back, President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, we can do all of that and we can do more. And I'm talking about implementing a clean energy standard and investing billions of dollars in everything from solar to geothermal to carbon capture. I'm talking about making the biggest investment in transmission in history so that the grid is cleaner and more reliable and more resilient. I'm talking about revitalizing manufacturing. So we're, we're making things in America once again. I'm talking about building an inclusive and unionized clean energy workforce to be able to do that. That's what we need to ensure that America can compete in and win a global market for clean energy technologies. And that global market is gonna hit $23 trillion by the end of this decade. $23 trillion is a huge market for us to go after. And if we don't do these investments, you better believe our economic competitors are gonna go after those that opportunity as well. So we need your help to be able to make these investments, to be able to plunk for America. So I really encourage you to make your voices heard on Capitol Hill, especially over the next three weeks. I wanna hear from you too, because I know this past year was really tough, but the energy industry, y'all, we are well on our way to recovery. And when Congress gets this done, then you can bet that next year's report and every year after that will show unprecedented job growth in clean energy across the entire country, offering good pay and good benefits and the chance to, to join a union for people of all backgrounds. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Jennifer, I think. Is that right? Yes. All right, yes. back to you. Yes, thank you, Madam Secretary. And with that, we are very, very excited to hear some opening remarks as well from Senator Shaheen, who, as you mentioned a while ago, we owe a great deal of gratitude and appreciation to for her fastidious efforts to make sure that this report was released and also was brought home to the Department of Energy. It's such a source of pride for us. So thank you. I'd like to have Senator Shaheen throw, I'm gonna throw it over to you now. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. I am so excited to be here with Secretary Granholm and with all of you who have worked so hard to try and ensure that this US Energy Employment Report um, gets done even when it wasn't at the Department of Energy. And I'm so excited to see it back at DOE where it belongs. Um, thank you to Nazio, to BW Research and to all of you who, who kept at it over the last couple of years. I was pleased to work with you to get some funding, but now we know that not only is it back at DOE, but we have um, legislation that will ensure that that is in the bill that came out of the Energy Committee last week. So hopefully we will not see this again. And as you all have pointed out so um, well, the fact is this is information that allows us to make decisions, particularly good policy decisions. And Secretary Granholm, as you talked about the investments that we're gonna be making in infrastructure in a clean energy standard, as we look at what we need to do to address climate change. And I can tell you here in New Hampshire, where over the weekend we had flooding in the Western part of our state because they got six inches of rain in several hours. 
we've got to make these changes that allow us to be competitive and also allow us to address the changes that we're seeing in our climate. I've been a big proponent of energy efficiency. It was one of the sectors in energy that was growing the fastest. And we saw last year that we lost more jobs in energy efficiency than in any other sector. So we need to see this information so we can make these investments as we're looking at infrastructure and at the, the other package that's gonna address the um, proposals that President Biden has put on the table. This is a great first start. It gives us the information we need and I'm so pleased to be with all of you to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Shaheen. We so appreciate all of your efforts in this regard. Uh, we are so, so thrilled to have you here and be a part of this very, very important release. And with that, I'm going to send it back over to Secretary Granholm to begin our roundtable discussion with all of our wonderful participants who are here and have some very exciting things to say around user, around energy jobs, and around the way that we are moving forward. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And Senator Shaheen, let me just, I want to follow up on, on some of your remarks um, because obviously your leadership in getting this report funded was so critical. And I'm wondering from, from your perspective, like why were you a dog on a bone on this? Why did this report interest you so much? And why, you know, why, why are you excited to see DOE take it up again for people who aren't familiar with it? Well, like you, I was a governor. And when I was governor, I worked on energy issues and recognized the jobs that could be created in the energy sector and the need for the United States to get out ahead of that. We know that our competition is looking at that. And if we expect to continue to compete to create those good jobs, we've got to, to make these investments. And in order to do that, to make those good policy decisions, we really need to have the information. And that's what's so important about this report. And as I was working on energy efficiency legislation in Congress, realizing that we weren't gonna have the information, the data that we needed to make the case um, was very concerning. And so that's why I've been working really since to try and ensure that not only do we have this report, but that it goes back to the Department of Energy where it should be so that you can take the information and build on it as you're looking at all of the efforts that are being made within the department to support growth in the energy sector and energy jobs. Amen. You know, that old saying, in God we trust, all others bring data. Yes, this is about the Absolutely. data to make those smart investments. So thank you again so very much. Let me let me jump over to Chris Bollinger, uh, Chris from Hikate Energy. Um, you know, Hikate has had two, I think, exciting renewable energy projects in the works in Ohio and Texas that are that are both being built with union labor. And I wonder, can you share more about those projects, why you decided to go union, how project labor um, uh, agreements and apprenticeship programs have helped you to attract, you know, a skilled workforce? Uh, certainly. Um, and thank you for the, for the opportunity, Secretary Granholm. I really appreciate it. Um, Hecate Energy is, is one of the uh, companies in this industry that, that does a lot of the front end work as far as pulling the projects together, deciding where the projects will go, working with utilities to interconnect, and pulling together the procurement and the labor contracts to get the projects built. Um, right now, we have projects under construction both in Cincinnati uh, or outside of Cincinnati in Ohio and outside of Houston in Texas both of which are, are applying union uh, labor through PLA. Um, and they, they provide a couple different approaches to, to working with union labor. In Cincinnati, uh, Mayor Cranley and the city uh, council uh, were very judicious in setting a level playing field and uh, requiring a PLA. It's something that we encourage and we're very supportive of. Um, you know, it's not a race to the bottom in, in pricing and um, quality. It should be a race to the top. And that's the way we look at it. We're very supportive and uh, competed head to head with other bidders, knowing that uh, PLA would be required and uh, very supportive of that. And, and that process, we work closely uh, through the bid and procurement process with the city who would be buying the electricity. Um, project in Texas, a bit different. Uh, PLA was not required. Union labor was not required. Uh, we just wanted the best quality at the fairest price and went out to competitive bid process with uh, half a dozen contractors we knew well. And 
we're looking to get the best project on the ground. We're talking over a million solar panels, over 100,000 steel posts. We need quality labor, trained and skilled professionals to ensure that, that those a million solar panels and 100,000 steel posts and hundreds of miles of cabling get installed properly and run for the, the next several decades. And so both of those uh, paradigms are very effective. And the more and more union labor that uh, is involved, the more we'll see the, the creativity, the expertise, the quality control, the cost cutting. Um, and um, it, it really should be a virtuous cycle. And we're very proud to be a part of it. It's, um, it's great to hear you say that, you know, there's uh, in some places in the country and in many places in the country, there's a huge fear of unions, that there will be cost increases, blah, blah, blah. Um, you were able to compete and win and have the quality that's necessary with uh, that union workforce. So it's a great story. Thank you so much for, for um, sharing it and for doing what you're doing, which is very exciting. Absolutely. Uh, let me, let me turn over now to Pedro Pizarro, who is the president and CEO of Edison International. Um, Pedro, you know, we, we know that we need to invest in transmission and, and distribution to get our grid cleaner and, and, and more reliable and more resilient. And I'm wondering if you could talk about Edison's uh, perspective on building union careers in electricity and how additional um, investment from the federal government could help grow the workforce. Well, thank you, Secretary, and happy to do that. And I think the punchline here is there's a lot of investment need ahead for the clean energy transition, and that means a lot of jobs with many union jobs. Uh, in order to decarbonize, just starting with a broad perspective, our peers at the Edison Electric Institute across investor owned utilities collectively deployed capital of over $140 billion just last year alone to provide electricity to 220 million Americans. And that supported more than 7 million direct and supplier jobs with labor unions representing many, frankly, most of the industry's skilled craft workers. Uh, I'm so pleased that the report is back in the Department of Energy, so thank you for doing that. Uh, another report that we saw recently here, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubators Green Jobs in LA 2021 report, uh, said that spending on green investments and sustainable infrastructure creates more jobs per dollar than other infrastructure investments. So these are accessible and well-paying jobs. And as we look at the clean energy transition, we uh, estimate in Southern California Edison that across all of California, across all utilities, um, we will need something like $250 billion more in investment through 2045, just in terms of uh, renewable resources, storage, and supporting the grid in order to do our part to get California to net zero by 2045. So we appreciate the uh, bold ideas in American Jobs Plan. We're doing our part. Let me give you a couple of examples where uh, we've done work that help, has helped to create those union jobs uh, and bringing electrification to our population. Uh, at Southern California Edison, we launched our Charge Ready 2 uh, program earlier this month that will invest uh, over $400 million to add 38,000 passenger vehicle chargers at multi-unit dwellings and workplaces and destination centers. More than half that investment is targeting disadvantaged and low-income communities. And there's a companion program of over $350 million to bring around 8,500 industrial chargers for heavy and uh, medium duty vehicles. So this transition to a clean energy future will require a lot of electrification, will also require investments for renewable energy production, storage, grid expansion, grid modernization, and all of that will drive a tremendous need for high quality and skilled, well-paying jobs. And you know, so many of those, uh, all the craft jobs will be union jobs. Uh, to make certain though that we have a fair and equitable transition and affordable transition across society, we need to make sure that we have policies that support a fair distribution of costs and benefits uh, fairly. Uh, and we need to be proactive, particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion as we recruit for the union jobs that will be required. Uh, you know, our, our company's really committed to this, starts with our board. Seven out of the 11 of us on the board are diverse in terms of gender or ethnicity or racial background or LGBTQ status, but let me give you one example. As we think about building our workforce further, which today is around 70% diverse, uh, we recognize that there are some groups that are not as well represented, particularly in our line trades. So uh, proud to share that we launched uh, earlier this year, the Edison International Line Worker Scholarship Program, starting with a $1 million pilot in shareholder funding to help train diverse union craft line workers uh, at the uh, Los Angeles Trade Technical College and as these folks graduate, they'll be eligible to start as SE groundmen. And I'd like to recognize our partners at IABW Local 47 
uh, for co-funding that effort. So as we look forward, we really need to make sure that the clean energy transition is coupled with that commitment to having a diverse workforce and particularly diversity in our, in our union ranks. Uh, there's a price here at the end of the rainbow, and that's that the transition will increase affordability for everybody. We estimate that because of the efficiency and electrification, uh, the average customer will spend a third less on energy in 2045 than they do today. But it's important that there's access to that benefit to everybody. So one of the requests from the federal government is making sure that you continue to accelerate the transformation by having the right support and incentives to make sure that everyone can access that electrification reliably and affordably. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for your emphasis on uh, you know, creating jobs and particularly our partnership with our with our labor unions and uh, happy to stay in touch as we move forward on this path. We will be. I know. Thank you so much uh, for that. Thanks for being such a clarion call for for making such a clarion call for ensuring that we are reaching all pockets of the country and all peoples that uh, environmental justice and equity are included in our planning. So thank you for, for your leadership on that in particular. Um, Thanks, let me hop over to Madeline Janice, who is the co-founder and executive director of Jobs to Move America. Madeline, I'm, Madeline I know uh, you advocate for workers in, in public transit and in electric vehicles, other uh, zero emissions uh, transportation industries. I'm wondering what are some specific policies that will create more union jobs in this sector and how can the federal government help? Thank you so much, Secretary Granholm. Um, I am a huge fan and really honored to be here. So as the report shows, actually the most highly unionized sectors with the wages that really create those better than average jobs are primarily in the fossil fuel sectors that are shedding more jobs, which leaves an enormous challenge to achieve the president's vision of a clean energy economy fueled by good union jobs for all. Um, fortunately, there is a three-part program that can build back better for the energy industry. So number one, the foundation is expanding and opening up Buy America requirements. Right now, Buy America laws require companies building transportation equipment to source 70% of their components domestically. But those laws are administered by transit agencies, most often in secret, and therefore can't be effectively monitored or enforced. We need to open up by America to the scrutiny of the public to ensure that there are no PO boxes masquerading as factories. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to number two, and really the most important part of this three-part program, Buy America alone doesn't create good union jobs or racial equity. They don't just happen. Secretary Granholm, what we need is for the federal government to directly attach something we call the US Jobs Plan credit to every dollar that is granted to private companies, whether through direct federal procurement or through federal dollars used by cities and states to purchase fleets and clean energy equipment. The idea of the US Jobs Plan credit is simple. In purchases or subsidies that have federal dollars, companies that commit to good wages, benefits, training, and equity can be awarded extra points and then have a better chance of winning the contract. Finally, we need high road training partnerships, and that's number three. And we need this in all sectors of the energy economy. The building trades, for example, as we've heard here, have a model for training and apprenticeship that really rivals countries like Germany and really in the world. Also the electric vehicle infrastructure training program uh, that's been created by IBEW and many other um, really amazing partners uh, for charging stations is very promising, but these are underfunded and limited and very few of the other sectors of the energy economy have this kind of training, this kind of partnership between unions and companies which is why we need to build on these models for industries like clean transportation, manufacturing, wind and solar manufacturing, and so many more. So let's strengthen by America. Let's create the US jobs plan credit and high, high road training partnerships. And that's the recipe for a clean energy jobs revolution. Okay, these are really great suggestions and great refinements on uh, enhancements, we'll say, on the president's Build Back Better agenda, which of course is all about Buy America and wants to make sure it incentivizes um, union jobs and, and uh, certainly prevailing wages and, and uh, PLA, 
um, uh, project labor agreements. Um, and so these are all, this is really great, really great. I really appreciate it. And of course, the amount of money that uh, that plan is going to invest into apprenticeships is ter terrific, but we ought to make sure that it's done in the right way. So thanks for all those suggestions, really appreciate it and your leadership. Let me jump over to um, Sandy Fazelli, who is the, with the National Association of State Energy Officials, which is NASIO. Sandy, thank you for joining us as well and for your leadership in this report. Uh, NASIO's leadership has been terrific and partnership. Wondering if you can share a past example of a state that may have responded to this data, the data that's in this report, by strengthening uh, their workforce development programs uh, or improving uh, diversity and inclusion in the energy industry? Yes, thank you so much for the question, Secretary Granholm, and for the gracious introduction and for the honor to be part of this discussion. Uh, your question gets to the heart of exactly why NASIO committed time and resources with the Energy Futures Initiative and BW Research to continue the report um, while DOE took a hi hiatus from producing it. Um, and the driving factor for us at NASIO is, is exactly the impactful ways that we've seen the user data used by state energy offices and other policymakers. We're extremely proud of the states that have taken action to support career and worker development um, in pursuit of their ambitious clean energy and climate goals and in tandem with those goals. Um, and especially so of the growing number of states uh, supporting those who have been historically underrepresented in the energy labor pool. Uh, the reality is that the energy workforce is not currently representative of the communities and economies that it serves. Um, and there are significant diversity shortfalls in terms of gender, ethnic and racial ability and other types of representation. The user data at the national level and state specific analyses used by state energy offices have highlighted this trend over time, but also pinpointed strategies and partnerships that may help break through it. Um, one example is from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, um, which produces an annual clean energy industry report. Uh, it's a state specific analysis based on user data, and it identified um, pretty early on in its production. Um, the need to diversify the, the New York clean energy workforce. And as a result of that analysis, New York's suite of clean energy workforce development programs um, really now use uh, innovative scoring and funding uh, methodologies in order to draw priority populations such as minority workers, veterans, and low-income New Yorkers into the clean energy workforce. Um, and if you'll allow me to talk about a couple of other state examples, because we, we're just so proud. Um, you know, another example is, uh, it really comes from the, the state and academic partnerships that we've seen um, in the clean energy workforce space, uh, particularly with minority serving institutions, uh, which um, offer a hub for community engagement, community development, and the building of an undertapped talent pipeline. Um, so the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, the energy office there has uh, partnered with North Carolina uh, A&T State University, which is an HBCU or a historically black college and university uh, to offer energy efficiency and solar apprenticeship programs, particularly targeting low and moderate income communities. Um, we also know of a program that the Minnesota Energy Office um, uh, has been offering in partnership with tribal serving institutions to bring weatherization and other clean energy technology deployments uh, to Minnesota's really robust suite of tribal communities. Um, and the examples don't just stop at deploying and installing the technology, but also fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and one of the examples uh, recently launched that I've been tracking closely is the Missis Mississippi Virtual Quad Incubator Project. Um, it's led by the Mississippi Energy Office in partnership with Jackson State University, a public HBCU, um, and a network of partners across the state. And its goal is to support Mississippi entrepreneurs and innovators launching businesses focused on energy and agriculture related technologies. Um, so the bottom line is that states are very rightly viewing opportunities for workforce and economic diversity across the in entire spectrum of energy technologies and job opportunities. Um, we know it takes partnerships, we takes, it takes a commitment to breaking through historic patterns, uh, but even before all of that work begins, it takes data. 
Um, and this is why we are so grateful at NASIO for the collective effort by DOE, by Senator Shaheen's staff, um, and by Senator Shaheen, your jobs team, the Energy Futures Initiative, and so many others in bringing this report back um, and creating some uh, security for it moving forward into the future as well. Great, thank you, Sandy. I mean, I think it really uh, shows as Senator Shaheen started by saying uh, she was a governor and govs use this stuff. I know it too. So it's really important to have the information to make good decisions. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Sandy, thank you for those remarks. We appreciate the partnership and the continued partnership with NASIO. Um, Senator Shaheen, so great that for your leadership and friendship and let's um, let's bring the rest of the uh, what's possible across the finish line, hopefully in the next uh, few weeks, uh, so that we can really see robust employment in this uh, area. Madeline and Chris and Pedro, thank you so much for, for your uh, great insights, great observations and great advice. This will not be our last conversation. We're really grateful. Everybody, you can download the report, go take a look at it and uh, let's go create some jobs. Thanks.